tumultuous time we've had this month weather-wise and the almost unprecedented storm Arwen in November, this might be a good time to kind of stop and consider where all this is heading. Extreme weather events that used to be rare are becoming more common, I think we would agree, not just here in Scotland, but around the globe. So where does that leave us in terms of agriculture and food production? And more importantly, perhaps, what can we do about it? So for this discussion this evening, leading the discussion, we're really lucky to have two incredible local experts who in their own ways um, have set out to challenge and educate us in what a changing climate means and how we can mitigate its effects. So I'll just briefly introduce um, Kate Trahern, Trahern, sorry, um, who's the community gardens and allotments officer for Dundee City Council. She's a green candidate for the May Council elections and she's an activist with Extinction Rebellion. Kate has done extensive work with Trellis, Scotland's therapeutic gardening organisation, and recently brought to life Campy Growers in Dundee, which is a community garden on the old council nursery site in Camperdown. Kate was described on the Creative Dundee website as, Kate used to be a scientist, but she's all right now. So that's Kate. And then we have Kevin Frediani, who's the curator of the Botanic Gardens and head of grounds at the University of Dundee. And intriguingly, a five-string banjo player. Kate, like, sorry, Kevin, like Kate, has had a very varied career, having managed the Amsterdam Botanic Garden and been the first curator of plants at London Zoo. He's produced research on vertical farming and he's won a Chelsea Flower Show gold medal. So I think you'll agree, two extremely worthwhile speakers. They're both keen gardeners, they're both experts in plants and local and international ecology, and they're totally committed to tackling climate change. So they're going to explore with us how our profit-driven food sector makes us more, not less, vulnerable to the effects of climate change. They're going to discuss how climate change is affecting the food we grow and what actions we can take in mitigation. Kate's going to focus on food growing and how important it is that people realise how little of our food is actually grown here. So we're not talking about climate change affecting agriculture in the UK, but on a global front and how, in her words, multiple global bread baskets are failing as we speak. Kevin will introduce us to, in his words, urban, peri-urban and rural landscapes whose ecosystems are being undermined through climate change and current unsustainable land use. Together, they'll look at what we can do individually and collectively to become much more self and interreliant to promote food security. And in this discussion, we can explore how we can act together to start addressing this wicked problem so I'm going to hand over to Kate to start the discussion with her presentation. Um, Kate, if, do you want me to change slides for you or do you want to? No, I think I'll be able to just share the screen. <clears throat> that might be better. better I'll, consider. I'll just do that. Um, not sure I'm going to be able to live up to that introduction but I'll do my best if I can actually share the screen in the first place. Is that working? It is. Good, mm -hmm. good. Okay, um, so this is the first time I've made a presentation on this particular topic. So I was doing it from scratch, so it may not be as polished as I would like. Um, <clears throat> this is the first harvest from the Camperdown Garden by the Campy Growers. And it's just a little reminder of how vibrant and beautiful those summertime vegetables are that we've all forgotten about now. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about that later, but I'm going to focus on um, a bit of scene setting going from global to local and um, yeah, just kind of get people's heads into the kind of place where they're going to start talking about things with interest. So uh, I think Jan said everything about introducing me. That's all you need to know. So I'll just get straight in there. 
and I need to be fairly quick, don't I? You don't want me going on and on and on. Um, okay, so the facts, first of all, the IPCC, rather conveniently, did a special report on food security, uh, and this comes out every year, so this is the most recent one. Uh, so fact one, we've got about 30% of total greenhouse gas emissions are attributable to the food system. So straight away, you can see that's really bad and it's feeding back on itself. If that's the amount of greenhouse gas that's coming out of the food system, you know, something has to change with that. Otherwise, we're just on a hiding to nothing. Second fact, <clears throat> observed climate change is already affecting food security through increasing temperatures, changing precipitation patterns and greater frequency of some extreme events. And bearing in mind, of course, that the IPCC always tends towards the conservative side of things, because they're amalgamating huge amounts of data and they've got to go through lots of iterations of it to make it acceptable to everybody. So when they say extreme events, you can probably assume that they mean really extreme events. Um, and the consumption of healthy and sustainable diets presents major opportunities for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from food systems and improving health outcomes. So if we do do something about this, the outcome is going to be good from the emissions point of view, but also from a health point of view. So what we've got on the right there is the bad positive feedback loop, which means the emissions are causing the extreme weather events, which are causing damage, which are then increasing the emissions, either from increased land use or you know, other issues that are going on with the whole entire system. So we've got two sides there. It's causing terrible damage. And if we sort it out, everyone will be healthier and better off. Um, so I was trying to find data about uh, the kind of imports and exports of food and how it balances out and it's quite difficult to get that information and then I found an old copy of which magazine that had everything just laid out perfectly so that's what I've done I've taken a photo of that diagram um, but I think we can probably trust what they say and when you look at the imbalance between imports and exports of fruit and veg you know what, that's mad, isn't it? It's like 10 times the amount that we export is being imported. Um, obviously, some of it is produced in the country and doesn't get exported at all, but there's obviously a huge amount that's coming in from outside. And we know that Brexit's had impacts on that, but one of the biggest impacts is gonna be extreme weather in other places that are actually producing the food for the UK. Um, the meat as well is absolutely crazy because of massive meat production in the UK. Why is so much of it being imported? Um, beverages is an interesting one because most of that is actually whiskey being exported. Um, and I'm going to focus on that a little bit later. So, yeah, Scotch whiskey is a huge um, industry, obviously, and massively profit making and uh, problematic in all kinds of other ways. I'll go into that a bit later on. And there's interesting things like coffee, tea and cocoa. You know, we're exporting 1.5 billion pounds worth of coffee, tea and cocoa. How does that work? Because we're obviously not producing it. So it must have been imported in the first place, repackaged, made into something else and then exported. You know, crazy amounts of transport involved in that. And you can see at the bottom there, um, twice as much animal feed is imported as exported. And when you think about it, why are we exporting? when we're importing. Why would you not just keep what you were going to import? No, keep what you were going to export and not import it in the first place. It's all, the whole system is just skewed and a little bit crazy. And the systems as well are fragile. And this is what we're starting to see is that these systems with the just-in-time delivery and their vulnerability to extreme weather and that kind of thing, means those systems are easily broken. Oh, and the fish thing, yeah. Don't even need to talk about the fish thing. That's just madness. Um, yes, so I think we've all encountered people who uh, say these things. This is a particularly annoying thing when they say, oh, but it'd be nice if it was a couple of trees warmer, wouldn't it? It would be really nice, that. I've got four words for them. The Atlantic Meridional Overturning circulation, also known as the Gulf Stream. Um, and this, this doesn't seem to have been reported very well that um, 
One of the major impacts that was predicted to have happened to, to happen with um, global warming is that this circulation would be weakened. And of course, we all know, and Kevin will know very well from uh, INBU, that um, it keeps the, basically the whole country a couple of degrees warmer than it would otherwise be. It's much more uh, impactful on the West Coast, of course, but our lovely maritime um, climate is basically controlled by the Gulf Stream, and it means that we can grow stuff here that we couldn't otherwise. And they've now shown um, there are early signals that it is starting to slow down as predicted. And there's another paper that I couldn't actually lay my hand, hands on that has measured that weakening. And they've measured it at about 15%. Um, so that's really, really scary because what, what will happen is that things will get colder, not warmer. And of course, the weather in general is going to become much more chaotic because of that. So those late frosts and other things that can destroy crops so badly are going to be really, really uh, unpredictable. Yeah, so we'll, what we're seeing already in terms of um, climate impacts are these hot, dry springs. I'm sure people have noticed the last three years, I think we've had nearly three months in the springtime with no rain. And it's just crazy. You know, April, where there's supposed to be showers, there's no rain. Just when the seedlings are trying to establish. And then suddenly you get deluging storms. It's like we're suddenly in some kind of monsoon climate. Um, <clears throat> yeah, incidentally, lack of frost can reduce fruit yield, and it can also increase um, the burden of pests in certain situations because the pests don't get killed by the cold. Um, and then, of course, the crops are going to get flattened by the hurricanes. And I remember, maybe not everyone here remembers, but I remember 1987 when Michael Fish famously said there was no hurricane coming because hurricanes don't happen here. And now suddenly we've had three hurricane force storms within a week. And people are barely able to clear up after the first one before the next one is hitting. So this is a serious wake up call. We're only at 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures and already it's absolute bedlam. So <clears throat> yeah, and the diagram on the right is just, you know, pointing out crop failures, lead to mass human migration, which we've already seen with um, Syria and Afghanistan, you know, the, this destabilization of places is all related to crop failures and climate impacts and ecosystem collapse. They all come as a package. <clears throat> so once we start looking at other places, obviously we've got climate chaos going on here, which actually I don't think many people expected it to have much impact here. But what we saw last year is serious drought <clears throat> in the Iberian Peninsula, which of course produces quite a lot of our food. Loads of it comes from Spain. Um, I don't know whether people saw that news this week of the ghost village appearing out of the uh, reservoir in Spain. And the story that was reported was that tourists were visiting this ghost village because it was fascinating to see this place that had been underwater for all that time. And nobody actually mentioned that it meant that there was no water in the reservoir because there'd been a drought going on for so long because of the climate emergency. So it's strange how people seem to be detached from the disaster that's right in front of their eyes. Um, so this is a quote I found in a report on the ongoing drought situation there. They could lose 60 to 80 percent of their production. And if that starts happening in Spain, we are in deep trouble. And obviously last year, um, that heat dome, which nobody's ever heard of before, it's supposed to be a once in a thousand year event. And that um, affected their fruit crops and the grain to say nothing of the ecosystem that was attempting to survive there. So obviously we're not just affecting ourselves, we're affecting um, whole entire ecosystems. And uh, despite the fact that that was meant to be a one in a thousand year event, in the Southern Hemisphere in January, another one appeared over Argentina. Um, and they are surprisingly, I think the second biggest exporter of soy 
in the world. Um, so they're producing an awful lot of feed stuff. Obviously, a lot of that is going into <clears throat> animal feed, but uh, massive production that has pretty much been destroyed. Um, yeah, second largest corn exporter after the United States. So a lot of that is going into uh, biofuels and that kind of thing. But still, when we're seeing those kinds of events happening in major production areas, normally if something disastrous happens, you know, the harvest from elsewhere in the world will compensate and they'll balance each other out. But when you're getting it happening again and again and again and again, those stocks, the stockpiles that are there will start to dwindle and there will come a point where there literally isn't enough. And that's obviously the point at which either you start to fight for it or it goes to the richest people. And that's where we really start to see horrible disasters happening because of course it impacts much more on the people who have done the least to cause it. And uh, I mean, all we can do is sit and watch it or, or is it? Maybe we can do something about it. And that's what I'd like you guys to come up with a bit of discussion about that. So this, yeah, the per, per D, the PAR D report talks about the risks of multiple bread basket failures. Um, very interesting report. I would recommend that you read it. It's a bit long and it's also a bit old. So it is more predictive and it was came out on the back of um, a disastrous drought that happened in 2011. Um, so yeah, they don't actually go into that, how bad it's been in that report, but it's worth having a look. Uh, yeah, the whiskey thing. So I don't know, people don't really take much notice of Scotch whiskey, you know, you might fancy a dram occasionally, but um, when you start looking into how it's produced, it's actually quite terrifying. So I raised this at a Nourish conference um, and it was immediately shut down. You're not allowed to mention whiskey as being in any way bad because it's such a huge industry, absolutely dominates um, the Scottish economy. So 1.3 billion bottles are exported every year. So that's an enormous number compared to the amount that's actually consumed here. Hardly any of it is drunk in Scotland. Most, the vast majority of it goes abroad. And we're quite short of arable land in Scotland. Um, I've got a map on the next slide, I think, that shows how much there is, but our, our arable land is really precious. And of course, if we're gonna start suffering from food shortages, it becomes even more precious. And about 50% of the arable land at any one time is under barley. And of course, it's not going into Scotch broth, it's going into whiskey. Um, so the whiskey is obviously made from the malt, which is just the sugar, and the grain that's left over afterwards is uh, then higher in, in protein, but it's described as spent because the malt has been extracted. Um, that does go into animal feed sometimes, but I had a, a brewer, a micro brewer boasting to me that all his spent grain went to anaerobic digestion. <laughs> I was a bit horrified that he was wasting all that lovely protein, which could be turned into um, a barley version of seitan. Um, when you look at where the money's going as well from Scotch whiskey, 40% uh, of the whiskey production in Scotland is owned by Diageo. So obviously none of that money is going to anybody local unless you've got shares in Diageo. Uh, and 20% of it is owned by, uh, owned by Perno. So we're looking at big multinationals that run the majority of the Scotch whiskey industry. And uh, the Scotch Whiskey Society uh, website proudly announces that they provide 11,000 jobs in Scotland. And if that um, their profits were actually evenly distributed amongst those 11,000 people, they would each get half a million quid every year, which they clearly don't. Um, so you can see that the money is literally draining away out of, out of the country. They also use peat. Some of the whiskies are known for being peaty and they use peat to smoke the, um, the malt before it gets, the malted grain before it actually gets extracted. And that's what gives it its flavor. And obviously we know that peat is 
essential and has to be conserved. The glyphosate situation, um, and people might not know this because I didn't realize until last year, there's um, a way of harvesting grain and uh, beans and soya beans and that kind of thing, which involves spraying with glyphosate two weeks before harvest. So it effectively kills the plant and then it dries out and then it gets harvested. And this is supposed to give a more consistent, reliable um, harvest time. And I really thought that they only did this in America and Brazil and places like that. But I found out that it's, it's a perfectly normal thing to do here in Scotland and virtually all the dry crops like barley or wheat or beans, if they might be growing beans, I suppose, they would be sprayed two weeks before harvest with glyphosate. So whatever they're harvesting is obviously covered in the stuff. And that's another big story of uh, how bad glyphosate is. But so everything is tied together with these kind of bad impacts that then build up and it and it becomes like a cascade of nastiness and of course alcohol is probably the most damaging drug known to humanity it causes more morbidity and mortality in the scottish population but equally in other countries you know we might as well be growing opium poppies and exporting heroin it's uh, you know there's nothing good about it and it's not the same as just having a nice little sip of a uh, single malt you know it, this is this is some um, nasty stuff um yeah so scotch whiskey has quite a lot to answer for that's just one specific thing and obviously there's lots of other um things produced across scotland that don't necessarily have a good impact on uh emissions health and all the rest of it so the point really is that <clears throat> The land is not used to grow food for health and nutrition, it's used to grow profit. And the system under which it's being operated, it extracts our fertility, pollutes the air, land and the water, and leaves us dependent on imported food. And also leaves other people dependent on imported food because where they're producing food to be exported, of course, they're probably importing other food that they could be growing. Yes, the whole system is crazy. Um, destroys the biodiversity. This is probably the one thing that I feel most passionately about is that our ecosystems are being utterly destroyed. And I think Kevin's going to touch on that, which is great. And yeah, we don't, and we don't even get to see any, any benefit from it. And Scotland is one of the most ecologically damaged countries on the planet. And uh, we know that, you know, health indicators in Scotland are pretty bad as well. So that, that map is actually quite interesting. It's the um, land capability classification. So it shows the quality of the land across the country for agriculture. Um, so you can see by the time it gets to the purple and gray, it's, you can't really grow anything on it. Um, so why not rewild a lot and make it actually useful as a carbon drawdown mechanism? Um, and the best land is actually around here. It's all around Angus and Fife and a bit of, around Edinburgh as well and north up to Aberdeenshire. So this is where that food could be grown. But as we've already seen, it's all given over to um, profit making barley for whiskey. Um, yeah, so my bias, of course, is that local food grow could help. And I guess that's what we're here to talk about. And uh, I guess we're not we're, we're not going to have the discussion immediately. I hope we're going to hear from Kevin first. But thank you very much for listening to me. I'll stop sharing that screen. There you go. Thanks thank you very Kate. much, Kate. That was that was terrific. And uh... As we are surrounded by fields of barley, it's particularly, I think, relevant to us. Kevin, do you want to take over now? Can you do your own yep. presentation? Just yeah, I'm just going to gonna check again that you can um, can see that as well. We can, Because I can't yes. see you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, so 
Uh, forgive me, because Kate and I didn't work our slides up together. I saw Kate's come through earlier, and I've got some links also to um, barley production. But probably my slides will complement um, this uh, challenge, which I'm calling the wicked problem. It's, it is a um, the global food system on one level has been described as one of the greatest human um, achievements because we don't have to think about where our food comes from, but therein lies the problem. And so I've also tabled this a primer for discussion because within that wicked problem lies um, something we're all complicit in, just in the way that we live our lives, that, that there are communities are in, uh, currently structured and the way that the world works. And uh, I hope to share some concepts some ideas, but also just feed into what I hope will be a healthy discussion uh, as well this evening. Um, I'm going to try to give a globalised food system overview, just to sort of think about that in that, think global and, and then let's come back to act, acting locally about what we might better do. I'm going to look at some of the issues um, that, that we need to explore when we're looking at this food uh, challenge and uh, look at also some potential solutions and things that we might look at that come afterwards and then um, again return to the discussion. I've got some of these slides which just flag up some images which should should challenge you, maybe they'll just reinforce what you already know, but effectively there are 10 big food companies globally that, that um, control all of the food supply chains. Um, so, at the, And this is into the Western world as we think about it. Interestingly, although it has the biggest impact globally on the way that land is used, most people are still feeding from peri-urban and urban agriculture globally um, because they, they are, they, they're fed from what they grow and not, what's, uh, what, not the way we think about food in the, in the Western world. And, and just so we've got a definition around the wicked problem, these are complex social environmental challenges where efforts to solve one part of the problem often lead to unintended um, outcomes in another part of the system. Let's have a look at that system. So here we've got um, the social system and the environmental system split on our screen. In the middle, we've got this food system, which is, is um, there are component parts of that. We've got production to think about. We've got processing and packaging. We've got the distribution and retail aspects of the food system, as well as the consumption and this other aspect that we see increasingly in the UK um, and something we should probably be ashamed of is food waste because up to 50% of our food, especially fresh food, ends up in the bin rather than actually consumed. And uh, there's something wrong within that that we would actually throw away something that's so precious, um, especially given all of the inputs and the impact that has on the environment. But the social system is a human system. It's the technological system. It's the system where we take, make, use and waste in a linear economy, which is globalized. The environmental system is the ecosystem. That's the natural system that provides the, um, through biological uh, diversity, living on, on the, uh, in the soil and, um, and in interacting with the wider environment around provides ecosystem as ecosystem services, the benefits that accrue to us, like cleaning up our fresh water, uh, providing oxygen on one level, but also health and well-being, especially in our urban uh, environment. Unfortunately, proposals to improve uh, the food system from a sustainability perspective often have a, a disproportionately emphasised one aspect of either supply or demand. They don't tend to address this whole system approach and we end up with problems popping up in other parts of the of the system and I'm going to talk about that um, through some examples. Um, my own work in terms of the last two years has been focused around uh, Angus looking at 300 years of land use and land cover change and what I came to realise over that since the improvements in the eight, early 18th century right the way through to the Green Revolution in the 60s and 70s, where we started um, reducing the height of our crops and improving the yield that came out of these uh, uh, crops that were that, that wouldn't be lodged out of the soil, but they required huge amounts of carbon um, uh, 
to grow them and, and nitrogen and phosphates to um, uh, get the most yield out of them in this, in this um, high, high input, high output system. The, uh, the land cover that we've removed to provide a, an agriculture of land use, reducing the hedgerows, um, increasing, or oh, oh, actually low, lowering, um, no, sorry, increasing the pH, removing the water through drainage, um, changing the ecosystem, not only impacted the environment, but it also impacted the state of our own well-being. And you saw, um, you see today that uh, in Dundee, something like 60% um, of people are on, uh, adults are on some sort of prescribed drug to help them with their own mental health and well-being. And so that means that we're not actually happy in the world that we've created. Um, if you go back to 1700, there were 90% um, uh, of people lived in rural landscapes. Today, that's reversed and we're over 80% of people living in urban landscapes. And we've lost our connectivity with the land, but also with the season. Um, if we look at these industrial monocultures, which have come out of the this uh, improvement and um, intensification and globalization, you can see that there are some valid cases for um, doing monocultures. They allow specialized production. It's got technological advances that you can, you can harvest in, um, with, with only a few people. It's got a high efficiency um, in terms of the productivity if we are measuring that as a metric not necessarily our inputs and outputs. There's greater yield from some produce and it's simpler to manage. There are also higher earnings for the individual corporate farmers, uh, individual large landowners or corporate farmers that we have now. But there are many, many um, problems with industrial monocultures, as we know that they're increasing with, their glo with global change with, and especially global warming, we're seeing um, increased pest problems. Uh, there are pesticide resistance as we've got very lazy in the way that we maintain our, our crops. We've got soil degradation. They talk about the last 30 harvests because we're not necessarily looking after conserving some of that precious resource that gives life. Um, there's a high use of fertilizers. You only have to look at the outputs into our rivers in Angus and the CEPA data shows that every watercourse um, that begins in the glens with clean water ends up in the seas with something that doesn't pass the EU safety standards. Um, maybe that's another reason for coming out of the EU. Um, on the environmental pollution and climate change, it's obviously not just to the water, as Kate mentioned, it's to the soil and to the atmosphere. They're de water demanding crops um, and water is a precious resource. Most of it's locked up in food actually globally. There's overproduction of commodity crops that provide these incomes to globalised food, food companies. And here, uh, Kate mentioned Diageo, which is the world's biggest alcohol producer, but there are 10, uh, just 10 global companies that control 90% of the alcohol market. So it just puts it into perspective. Again, it's corporate money. Um, interestingly, we feed that with, um, we use our public taxes or governments do to um, subsidize agricultural crops to be grown for these companies. They, they put money into research and development and that money then goes off to shareholders who don't even live in this country. Um, we see declining biodiversity and two out of every five plants in the world today is threatened with extinction by 2100 because of unsustainable land use. And that's the latest Q report that was produced in 2021. And um, we've got insect biodiversity decline and um, even the agricultural bee is um, now seeing uh, because they're not wild bees they're, they're um, a, a, an agricultural crop just just like our, our field crops um, are seeing dangers from the, the, the chemicals that we're putting into our agricultural systems and there's a high risk of, of loss and failure and the implications of that into our, our own supply supply or supply chains that feed us. So it is vulnerable. I'll talk about that a bit later on as well. Um, fossil fuel is underneath all of this and it's not climate smart for all of those reasons. Interestingly, you can summarize this with uh, the benefits for are just financial and against they're almost completely environmental. It's our environmental system that's undermined to make a profit for the few. 
I used my first case study was also barley, and I wanted to dig into some of those um, figures because it's the most, it's the fourth most in, important cereal crop in the world. Interestingly, it used to be the staple food in Scotland, beer, barley, but the barley that we're now producing is very much going towards either malting or feed and feed for animals in an unsustainable way as well. So um, we look at the Scottish um, production, it's mostly spring barley rather than winter barley. Um, that has actually some environmental be benefits in terms of growing a spring crop and a winter crop. There's less Kevin? pesticides put onto it. Hello? Sorry, I'm not sure that your screen's changing the, um, oh, it, the slide. I'm not sure if you're human. sharing the right screen. Which, which screen are you still on? We can still see the, um, the first slide. Um, That's it. Yeah. So you're now seeing the barley production. One. Yes. Okay. So uh, I, am, I have sent out these slide decks, so hopefully they can be sent out to all of you afterwards so you can see them. But uh, can I just check that that's swapped now? Yep. Yep, that's great. Okay, so what we see linked into those production areas that Kate talked about is around um, Dundee and Angus. It's the, one of the principal production areas um, and 92% uh, of uh, the barley production is going into distilling um, rather than as export or for food. Interestingly, we've got 700 million pounds being invested into barley through the Tay Cities deal, the Scottish government being matched by industry um, to, to focus on this crop, which is really an export crop, as Kate said. If we look at protected crops now. I don't know if you're aware of this because it hasn't been reported in the news, but the main growers in the UK at the moment aren't, aren't sowing their tomatoes and cucumbers. The gas prices have gone up so much and that impacts not only the, uh, most of them run combined heat and power plants, so they, 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 the waste heat allows them to grow the crop and the, and the waste CO2 elevates and allows the crop to grow. However, if the gas is too expensive, the crop off offset costs don't make sense and then they're, they're not making enough money out of both the electricity they generate and the feeding tariffs together with the crop to allow it to be grown so many of them have now um, turned into net importers and so they're they're buying in tomatoes and cucumbers from uh, morocco and then selling them on through their normal supply chains and and that, that makes more economic sense to them than it does to put a crop in the ground and then rip it out later on or not in a ground in a hydroponic system. And this was the, uh, this is current news. It's uh, as of last week, um, there was a visit on the 11th of February uh, by an MP to the, to the same um, nurseries that he went to in 2018. And you can see completely clean, sterile environment, ready to grow, but there's no crop being grown this year. And at the moment, uh, it doesn't look like they will grow a crop this year. It will stay empty. It's just um, on one level just doesn't make sense. But that's the reality of where where the, they are now. When it comes down to it, if we're looking at the challenges, there's an unbalanced governance model currently. We've got um, we've got government that's very weak. Um, it uh, yields to the demands of industry. We've got a very strong corporate model around the world. And um, we've got a civil society that A, doesn't know what goes on. It's quite blind to it. There is actually um, um, a phrase around this. It's called homophily. It's the love of sameness. Um, it creates social groups that are made up of individuals with similar views, beliefs, and experiences. If we don't think about where our food comes from, but we benefit from strawberries coming out of season and we can watch the latest TV fads and go and buy it in Sainsbury's or Tesco's or Waitrose or any of those shops, then actually we're, we're, we, are, we are not only complicit in this food system, but we don't really have, have any concern about it because we're getting what we want at that point of time. It's feeding us in the way that we want. If we can afford it, that's easy, isn't it? But the impacts on this wider um, uh, system is, is really all geared up to feeding uh, a corporate greed um, where there isn't any of the social benefits that used to come from corporations before, um, before the model changed in the, in the 19th century and we started seeing um, a growth for profit and for shareholders over a growth for society. And, and that's a, 
a big change. If you want to read about that, there's a lovely book by Caroline, Caroline Steele. It's a little bit old now. It's called Hungry City, but it's still very valid and it goes back and shows how those food systems aren't working. There are some potential opportunities for us, and that's what I want to go on to now, because um, we've got regenerative agriculture, which looks to improve um, the way that we grow the food system locally. And th that's measured through the quality and quantity of soil that we produce. And uh, it's not so much measured on the outputs of just yield or profit, but the whole system, including the biodiversity that's around that system. Um, there are improved governance models where we can actually look at um, community uh, owned agricultural models. And um, Kate talked about Campy Grows, but through CSA, there's an opportunity for us to, to buy into shorter supply chains that feed our hungry city where we live. We can also think about seasonality in food. At the moment, I use the, the strawberry model as an example where, where something that used to be savoured around the time of Wimbledon now is pretty well ubiquitous. You can pick them up at any time of year. Um, there's also something around crop diversification, because at the moment we've got a world relying upon wheat, rice, maize and soya bean. And we just mentioned barley from an alcohol perspective. But those five crops uh, are really under threat without this constant research and development to um, keep try to keep ahead of pests and diseases. We, we're, we're going to see a crash at some point in one of those crops. Um, and if we do, the impact is, is well, not worth thinking about. But in um, a recent book, my old professor of um, agronomy, um, a guy called Dr. Saeed Azam Ali, wrote a book called The Ninth Revolution, where he was saying that what we actually need is a food revolution, not an evolution. The time is running out for that. And that, that will include looking at these urban, peri-urban and integrated rural ag agricultural systems that feed our hungry cities, but also the diversity of crops we grow, not just for food, but for fiber, for fuel, for pharmaceuticals, for dyes. You know, we don't just use land for growing food. Um, and also we share the planet and the land with the, the biodiversity that brings us other benefits in terms of ecosystem services. My last slide looks at the balance of this social system um, and tries to put some sort of uh, um, um, thinking around this economic, social and environmental centre in this umbrella of sustainability. How do we move towards something where companies, universities, R&D institutes, governments, customers, as well as suppliers, their competitors, complement each other so that we have uh, NGOs not lambasting uh, corporate greed, but actually working together to help feed 10 billion people, which is the forecast. There, that if you look at the traditional KPIs, I've listed the ones that corporate bodies would look at, which would be around product services, the processes and business models that underpin that, and also the business networks. But I would add to that the social health and well-being. That's a met metric we should use, not just gross national product. Or, it should be about the happiness of our of our um, population and also this environmental aspect which is increasingly important for us to both understand and to um, work towards restoring because it's uh, it's currently at, at a catastrophic level um in in the in the again returning to my own research around that angus model um angus has been uh, in agricultural production for well over uh, a thousand years, two thousand years, actually go back to the Romans. In fact, we were importing timber into the country in 600 um, AD, so a long, long time ago, because we we removed the resource from this productive land on the northeast of Scotland, and yet 40% of our most precious land resource is around Dundee, uh, within 30 miles of Dundee, and and we use it to grow food, grow drink that pollutes other people's bodies someplace else for profit. That just doesn't feel right. And um, there's gotta be a better way of dealing with that. And so it, my last contribution is just to say, you know, I'm not judging in this, I'm just passing observation on it because it's much too 
bigger problem for any individual. But if we are going to act in a social way, we've got to do it together. Um, there is, There are ways of influencing those uh, models and the group I'm working with is the tight Tayside bioregion at the um, at the catchment level because that's that's it's the water that feeds the land uh, that feeds into our crops and um, and and it's the water quality that we should be measuring success when it when it leaves our land and goes into the sea at the moment we're failing and it'd be nice to think that in the next 15 years we can reverse that so our water quality is uh, just as good going out into the seas as it was coming into the off the mountains. And with that, I'll leave this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. That's a huge amount to think about.